Welcome, everyone. I think we'll just maybe give it a couple more seconds to see if anyone else will be joining us. But I expect that a few people might be dropping in. All right, I think given given the tight schedule we have for the session, I'm going to get started and say good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time zone you're joining us from. Uh, it's my pleasure to offer a warm welcome to you uh, for this session. On behalf of the two organizing partners, the Dakamaho Foundation and the Life and Peace Institute, we're pleased to have you joining us. And I want to take the, uh, a moment here at the outset to also say thank you to CIPRI and to the Swedish Foreign Ministry for hosting us and for the full session, uh, for the full Stockholm Forum with all of its uh, very interesting sessions. We're very pleased that you've taken the time to join us for this uh, roundtable on how effective is the current peace building financing architecture at building peace, reflections from local to global peace actors. We realize that you've likely been in many similar conversations uh, over perhaps the past months or, or even years. Uh, there have been many on how to strengthen or fix or improve financing for peace building. We know this is a really important topic. Uh, it's one that had a great focus in the 2020 peace building architecture review last year that concluded with two new parallel resolutions where the importance of strengthening financing for peace building was one of the main uh, areas of focus coming out of that. And it's also one of the main themes of this forum as a whole, the peace building financing. Uh, and we know this is a really important topic in particular, uh, given the impact of the COVID pandemic and the great needs uh, that have resulted from that, but also the uh, stress on resources available. So I have to confess that sometimes it's hard not to feel a bit cynical coming to these conversations, feeling that You've had them before. Um, there have been so many discussions on how to improve peace building financing um, and, and, and with little outcome. But I really encourage you, I welcome you to join me in, in checking any cynicism at the virtual door and really seeing this as an opportunity to have a reflective conversation with uh, different stakeholders uh, from many different levels and different, many different contexts to really not to rehash the challenges or to come up with recommendations for others, but, but for us to think together constructively uh, about how we can change and shift the system from our individual vantage points to improve financing for peace building with outcomes at the local level. Uh, so we have a, a great list of uh, lineup of, of panelists, and I'm really pleased to be able to turn this over uh, to someone who is very well suited to guide us through this conversation, someone who's um, probably familiar to you from her work uh, over the past years on this topic, and who we're very pleased to have working with us at the Dalkamakho Foundation as a senior advisor. So please, over to you, Riva. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sigrid, and good very early morning from New York. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you may be. Um, and as uh, to underscore what Sigrid said, um, you know, what, what is the purpose of this session and why have we structured it in this way? Our intention is to, truly, to try to really get at the how of how the current global funding architecture could be more effective at building and sustaining peace. So uh, what does good peace building financing mean in practice and particularly thinking about uh, more effective support to local peace builders? So we know that the data tell us that the global donor community isn't doing a fantastic job of getting resources to local peace builders. Um, and we have agreed as a community of practice that this is important. It is a, it's a priority and it's a challenge. And we know why it's a challenge. Many of us have, have written and been talking about this challenge for some time. So this is all to say that we know what the consensus is in terms of the conversation around funding local peace building in particular. Uh, we know the imperative to shift the donor system towards more power and agency and therefore more resources to local peace builders. 
again, today, our hope is to really focus on solutions, to dig a little bit deeper into the actual obstacles to shifting this system. How do we move the rhetoric and the good intentions around good peace building financing into action? Um, so part of this consensus is that we have also agreed on a generally accepted set of principles related particularly to funding local social change efforts in general. We know that we need flexible and adaptable resources that are not project specific. We need longer time horizons. There's a whole body of thought that converges on these principles and yet they haven't been adopted systematically by funders. And so there needs to be more work on advocacy around the uptake of these principles. That's one starting point for our conversation today. In addition to the principles, we are also trying to focus again on the how. How do we operationalize these principles? And to do that, a second starting point and organizing rubric for our discussion is to try to understand our different roles from a systems perspective within this global funding architecture. We're all working on peace building, but from different entry points. And that means we also have different strategic advantages, different obstacles, and particularly as it relates to financing. Um, so to that end, we've asked our panelists to reflect on a set of framing questions, which I'm going to share because we thought it actually might be helpful for our audience and for all of us to reflect on these. Uh, so the first question is, what is the ideal role of your organization or institution in the global peace building financing system? Are there things that you are often not asked or expected to do in regard to financing and funding that you are not able or best suited to do and why? Second, what needs to change in order for you to play that ideal role highlighted in the first question? And finally, how can the other speakers and their organizations or institutions support you in uh, pursuing those changes? Or how can the other members of our audience and community here today? Um, so along with all that we know, you know, we've again spent a lot of time reflecting on the challenges and the obstacles. We do have an agreed upon set of principles to overcome these obstacles. Can understanding and really exploring our ideal roles in this global peace building financing architecture and an architecture that in some ways um, is unlikely to change, can this help us reimagine this system and ultimately Again, as Sigrid said, how do we stimulate new thinking as a collective community about how we can uh, more effectively finance peace building and in particular shift power and agency to local peace builders, money being one lever to do that. Um, so just a conceptual note that we've organized our panel around the idea of both global and local perspectives. So of course, we know that this it's not a continuum, it's probably not a nexus, it's, we're not sure what the right <laughs> um, visual is, but you know, we know that the local and global are intertwined, that individuals and organizations move between these levels, who self-identifies as a local peace builder may, you know, vary according to context. So this is really a heuristic, it's to help us reflect on the strategic advantages and ideal roles that we all might generally play in building and financing peace. And um, to that end, I, we've, we have a poll question, I believe. I'm, I'm not the person to ask about the technical. There it is, okay. <laughs> um, so we have a poll question for you today um, that we thought would give us some information about who is in the space here together. Um, and a, in a minute, we'll put up the results. So, you know, we can see as an audience and, and participants and reflect on who is in these conversations. Uh, as an audience member, you know, where are you located in this global peace building system? And, you know, is there a balance or imbalance in this conversation? So before I hand it over to our fantastic panelists and just two quick procedural notes, given the time limitations, we've decided to manage the session by hearing from our five speakers. And then we've been in invited an additional three colleagues from the peace building community to respond. We were concerned that we wouldn't be able to do justice to a democratic and open discussion as a whole. However, our colleagues are actively moderating the chat. We hope that you will engage and comment and we 
uh, look forward to all of your thoughts there. And just a final reminder to our speaker to look for my backwards uh, one minute and 30 second time. So thank you very much. And um, now over to our first speaker, Shale Bilo. Shale is the Somalia Program Manager at the Life and Peace Institute. And Shale, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Riva, for this introduction. Uh, my name is Mohamed Shale. I work with the Life and Peace Institute as the program manager uh, for Somalia. Uh, LPI, Life and Peace Institute, is a peace building organization that has been working on the peace building sector for more than 30 years, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes region. Uh, our main focus for the last uh, years has been uh, supporting local reconciliation process and local peace building process. And to that end, uh, LPI as, a, as an organization that deals with peace building has been partnering with a national civil society organization and local organizations in, in, in creating peace at the grassroots level. In the global financial peace building uh, sector, the LPI is not a donor organization. LPI is an implementing agency that works with uh, its partner organizations in, in ensuring that peace is attained at the local level. If you look at the LPI's mode of operations, <clears throat> and particularly in, 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 in Somalia, uh, LPI has a lot of experience when it comes to how to bring change at the grassroots level. And I think the uh, global financial system and the global, sorry, uh, global uh, peace building financing system uh, should focus into account the different experience, the different influences, and the different uh, needs of each of these actors within the peace building sector. For instance, there are those who are working on the grassroots level, and there are those who have influence at the, at the higher level. And, 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 and our experience is that different sectors have different experience and different influence, and they tend to put a lot of emphasis and their finance on those particular aspects that they think they have a comparative advantage of. Uh, as LPI, we are also guilty of that, that we look at the local peace building perspective as the most effective way of building peace. Whereas other actors, for instance, uh, put a lot of emphasis on, on the assumption is that if you look at it work from at the higher level, then peace can be attained at the level. Uh, from where we are working currently in Somalia, if you look at our own local experience in Somalia. Uh, the peace, peace building actors, for instance, are torn about between whether to see peace building from a state building perspective or building relationship and within communities at the grassroots level. A lot of resources and finance has been generated and, 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 and taken into account in the state building process. Uh, for instance, the peacekeeping missions in, in Somalia through the African Mission of Somalia, uh, the UN have all been putting a lot of resources in terms of how to recreate the state of Somalia uh, through hard security. Whereas for instance, local civil society organizations like LPI are more focusing a lot on, on the grassroots level in terms of how to bring peace within, within, within Somalia. So the danger and, and the challenge is that each of the sector are not is, is working on its own, and, and therefore the, the donor community and the, and the donor community has not been able to focus in the same way as each of the needs is required. So if I put it that way, the scale is, is heavier on one side on the other. Uh, for instance, in Somalia, the scale is heavier in terms of how to rebuild the states, and a lot of funds and, and money is generated. Is, is, is geared towards the state building process and hard security in terms of uh, keeping the peace through uh, security measures. But the other aspect of peace building, which for instance, LPI and other local civil society are very much engaged is building relations between communities at the local level. So the greater challenge for me is how do we create that kind of relationship and how do each of those sectors uh, complement each other? And how do we create a situation where the local peace building perspective fits into the, the, the state building process. And, and, and therefore, the donor community and all the architects of the peace building system uh, should look into how to create harmony between all those sectors and avoid the silencing of, 
or funding within this sector. Uh, and also, if you look at the current shape of the global uh, financial system of, 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 of the peace building funding architecture, uh, a lot of neglection is a lot of to the local civil society organizations and national civil society and, and, and generally civil society organizations. Uh, the UN Peace Building Fund, for instance, which LPA has been one of the few organizations that got an opportunity of uh, being part of uh, an implementing activity that is funded by the UN Peace Building Fund. Uh, a lot of changes are now being seen within the, 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 the peace building sector. Initially, the UN Peace Building Fund, also most of the funds has been geared towards supporting the UN system, the UN agencies that are working in Somalia. Uh, because of the bureaucratic nature of the UN, uh, uh, it was not possible for local civil society organizations or even national civil society organizations or even international organizations working within Somalia to access those kinds of funding so that they can implement activities within uh, their areas of operation. But LPI, and, and, I, and I want to give credit to the UN for opening up this space. By open, after opening up this space to civil society organization, LPI was the first organization that got an opportunity of receiving those funds. What has the LPI's involvement in implementation of those uh, active, uh, access to those funds changed on the ground? I think uh, from practical perspective, a lot of uh, peace building fund has now reached to remote areas where it could not have reached before because of the kind of access that LPI and its partner organizations have. So it could be able to reach to remote areas within Somalia Lakes of Johar, Baidoa, Abudwa, and the rest, where the UN agencies, because of the security nature of work of their work, will not be able to reach. So that is a true testament that if uh, civil society organizations are empowered, civil society organizations are part of the uh, financing system, then a lot of communities can be reached through the, through them because the civil society organizations are able to reach. Then I think the other aspect that I, I would like to emphasize here is uh, the need to have a uh, short-term or long-term changes uh, funding system. The funding system needs to be uh, taken into account the need for long-term engagement. Uh, so long-term uh, funding system is crucial so that we can have a meaningful change and also be flexible and, and less about uh, bureaucracy in the way we dispense funds to uh, civil society organizations. Thank you, River, for reminding me that my time is up. I'd like to I conclude by saying, uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Those are, I think, really important insights and great to hear how this these funds uh, from the PBF have particularly made a difference in Somalia. Um, in a great transition, we are now going to go to Marcus Lenzen, who is a senior advisor with the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund at the United Nations. Uh, Marcus, over to you. Thanks, Riva. And uh, it is, of course, uh, immense pleasure to have uh, Shala speak before me, as indeed uh, Life and Peace Institute was the first direct uh, non-governmental recipient for the fund when, when, when Somalia became eligible uh, for, for this and in a, in a competitive process. And, and, uh, and it's part of, uh, you know, the, the, I think an important point that in spite of all the cynicism and a lot of which I, I can also share having worked in this field for quite a while now, as the Sigrid was saying, there is change <laughs> and, and even, uh, you know, UN organizations that can be accused of being overly bureaucratic can, can, can adapt and, and do things differently. Um, and I think the Peace Building Fund has a, a pretty good story to tell in the last few years in this regard. And, and one great example is, is what Charlie was, was referring to. So, so what, what is, uh, I, I saw on the poll, it seems like I'm one of the few multilateral, uh, there was like 2% or one recipient, that must have been me, uh, uh, in this spectrum. So, uh, so what, what is the role of the fund in, in the peace building system as a UN system-wide uh, multi-donor instrument? Um, and and uh, uh, what's the ideal role it should play? I think the first thing to to stress is that as a, as a pooled funding instrument, right? It is, it is supposed to help make um, uh, 
funding uh, more accessible and streamlined by getting donor states. And the reminder that the fund relies almost exclusively on funding through member states, right? Uh, as an expression that uh, peace building is, of course, a core raison d'etre for the United Nations. But there is no one part of the United Nations that does that. It is something that most and or a lot of parts of the system should be working towards to different degrees. And of course, given how big the system is, it is not always easy to do this in a, in a coherent way and also to do this quickly enough. So the one hand, member states decided to create the fund as part of a peace building architecture back in 2005, initially to say, you know, we need to get funding faster into certain areas to start up things in more, much more in post-conflict settings, right? And to say we can pool funds and have a, you know, an UN internal system that makes funding available for the UN system in an integrated way and gets, you know, different parts of the system to work together coherently faster that way, rather than every part of the system going individually and separately to lots of different donors to try to raise funds. And that, of course, remains an issue, but, you know, multi uh, you know, donor and pooled instruments are, are sort of, you know, I, I think it remain a good way to do so. For a long time, the fund was focused on these post-conflict, small, quick up uh, startup things. And then we had, of course, an important change with the 2016 uh, sustainable, um, sustaining peace resolutions uh, and an increasing recognition that peace building isn't just post-conflict recovery, right? And a lot of us here on this call will understand that, that there's a much bigger spectrum and that an instrument like the peace building fund also needs to address this, that we need to think much more uh, as a spectrum. And the fund has, therefore, over the last few years, uh, become also much more, or has been responding to this much bigger notion that has become expressed in those resolutions and, and was able to do so because member states gave uh, sort of that 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 narrative through the resolutions right and, and therefore now able to i think address peace building in a in a more holistic way um so the, the second thing apart from 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 getting the the un to work together coherently in different parts of the system all based on i think the conviction that i think a lot of us again will share peace building is the kind of issue that that rarely uh, can be achieved by just one actor and especially given that, you know, coming from a governmental organization, you know, uh, the, the UN is an expression, I often like to say, of how a lot of governments are structured, right? Line ministry by line ministry. And we have agency by agency and getting them to work together and go beyond their lines is, is a challenge for any government, right? Uh, and, and but financing, good peace building financing uh, is a way to incentivize this and get uh, the actors to go together. And for a long time, the fund was, as Charlotte was saying earlier, focused exclusively on doing that for the UN agencies and system. And that remains a key focus for the fund. But of course, in the recognition, again, expressed clearly in the 2016 Sustaining Peace Resolutions that this is not about the UN only. And there are many places where the UN, uh, whichever agency we're talking about, is not necessarily the best place to reach certain populations, to work in certain geographies. They're just not present there, where uh, the civil society organization may have much better access um, that also means the funding should flow differently, right? And of course, there are different ways to achieve this. And what the fund has been trying to do in the last few years is, you know, five years ago, the fund did not fund civil society organizations directly at all. So the first thing was, you know, through the gender and youth promotion initiatives, which are special competitive calls the fund does every year uh, in response to, to the respective UN resolutions, and the recognition that remains the same today, that these are areas that are incredibly underfunded and that hasn't changed. And in the fund's new strategy for 2020-24, all the consultations we did with civil society, with the UN said, don't take your foot off that pedal. This remains terribly underfunded. Keep the focus on these uh, you know, special initiatives. That was the first way where civil society organizations could apply directly to the fund rather than being you know, part of a pass on through, through some UN agency uh, in the first place, right? So that was an important broadening uh, uh, of, of, of partnerships. And of course, you know, we, we however often get asked, why can't you do more than that? If it's just this competitive uh, thing, right? And so what we have started to do, learning the lessons from how this has been working the last few years is also to say, well, there's nothing, you know, that keeps us from actually funding a civil society organization directly. The one thing, of course, is that it's a 
governmental instrument. It's a, a multilateral instrument. And a key principle for the fund is national ownership, which for us, on one hand, is expressed, we need the government's sign up, right? So this uh, uh, is, is, is an important role that we are a connector between a host government that has to sign up, but to make the space for a lot of different agencies that have something to contribute to peace building, but also for other actors. Um, and just last year, also in the gender and youth promotion tips, we for the first time also prioritized and encouraged proposals where UN and civil society organizations did joint proposals rather than the CSO again being just sort of somewhere down the line. And of course, we have a criterion that even UN agencies uh, in those initiatives uh, that, that uh, apply directly and only that have um, uh, 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 that must give at least 40% of the funds received to local organizations, right? So we have a few criteria to try to make this happen. We often get asked to do a lot more of this uh, and more directly, which we find very difficult as a global fund. And I think just the last part of brief is what can you all do to help us more with this? And of course, one is to look at this in a complementary way. We cannot do everything that we're asked for as a centrally managed fund from New York, but to look at what we can do as a catalytic fund and to align other projects more with what we're doing, and of course, to, to work in partnership on the ground and ultimately at the outcome level, help keep telling those stories so we can also make the case for, for more funding in this respect, because donors, uh, while we've been successful in growing the fund quite a bit, and we're trying to make the case for peace building really hard, it, it, it's an uphill struggle and they want to know, but what are the outcomes? What impact are we achieving? And I think as a peace building community, we've come a long way, but we still have quite a far way to go. Thanks, Riva. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Marcus. It's great to hear your perspective. Um, and now we're going to move to Eddie Biamungu, who is a senior lecturer at the Free University of the Great Lakes Countries and the director of the Peace Support Office in the DRC for Peace Direct. Eddie. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, to be a part of this uh, a great panel. Uh, my name is Eddie Biamungu. Uh, I've been conducted by uh, the moderator. Uh, I work for uh, a peace building, uh, for the peace building uh, support office in DRC, uh, Bureau de Soutien in French. Uh, which is a corporation uh, of local experts, Eastern of DRC. Uh, it's not an NGO, but an organization uh, that is supporting uh, local civil society in capacity building, coordination of their actions and led large-scale advocacy actions. Uh, in terms of uh, the role we should play in the global peace building uh, financing uh, system, I think we should support local civil society organizations uh, in accessing funding for their uh, peace building initiatives. Uh, of all, uh, the local peace building, uh, local uh, peace building uh, local peace building organizations in uh, North Kivu, in South Kivu, and in Ituri province, and uh, we have uh, already uh, divided uh, them into uh, thematic uh, subgroup, uh, subgrouped uh, thematic, in order to help them to uh, avoid competition for resources and to coordinate their actions uh, well and uh, at uh, the grassroots uh, level. We should now help them access uh, the fund, fund uh, for more efficiency in their actions. However, uh, they ask us uh, where the donors are but uh, I think the donors uh, seem to be uh, ghosts because we only know them by name, but we, 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 we have never seen them uh, and the system, uh, the 
peace building fin uh, global finance uh, uh, system has too many intermediaries uh, uh, between donors uh, it's ineffective uh, in sense uh, uh, that uh, the, the beneficiaries and the local peace builders uh, have been uh, have been designing some good initiatives in order to uh, propose some local solution to local issues, but uh, they don't uh, have any. Andy, can you hear us? I think you've frozen on my side. Can we ask the moderators if they could turn the video off, perhaps, to increase the bandwidth? Uh, just done so. Let's see if you return. Thank you. Let's just give it 20 seconds and we'll Um, well, we will certainly come back to Eddie um, if we can get his internet connection back. But um, in the meantime, uh, let's move on to um, to Peter. Um, Peter, I'm going to pass the floor to you. Um, and I don't, I don't see Eddie on my screen, but um, hopefully he will be able to join us, uh, rejoin us shortly. Um, Peter Lanier is a senior program manager in the Peace and Security Human uh, Unit at um, CEDA. At Peter, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Riva, and hello all. Um, I hope we're not seen as one of the ghost donors that uh, Eddie was talking about. Um, uh, maybe this will help that we're seen here at least. Uh, thanks for inviting Sida and Sweden uh, to this interesting discussion. Um, we are trying to promote the concept of good peace building financing, and this is an excellent platform to do just that. So what does that mean to us in Sida and particularly to us in Sida's global unit for peace and human security, where I work? Well, we're trying to practice what we preach and we follow uh, five principles in all our partnerships. We're also trying to promote them to our donor colleagues wherever we can. These principles are mutually uh, enforcing each other and intertwined. Uh, first one, value-based partnerships. A donor re a recipient relationship always has a built-in power structure in it. But we try to view this instead as a mutually beneficial partnership where confidence and trust are the key foundations. In practice, this could mean simplified reporting demands, which are also based on our partner's own system, not our, our own system. And transparency with our own assessments and reviews of partners. And we are also open to criticism and build, willing to adjust uh, our approaches and methods. Second, long-term wishes. It's been mentioned uh, before, uh, but nevertheless, this is very important uh, and especially important in context with sustained crisis and violent conflicts where patience and long-term thinking is, is key for sustainable peace. In practice for us, this could mean um, multi-year financing agreements. A long-term local presence is also key, as we've heard uh, from other panelists today. Third, uh, core support or at least soft earmarking. This form of funding allows for strategic planning based on needs and the dynamic situation on the ground and not by the donors, sometimes temporary priorities. A common misconception is that funding, this funding form will not provide the donor with concrete results. Au contraire, we have seen that core support instead improves the quality of, of the results as well as the reporting. Fourth, flexibility. 
has also been mentioned uh, many times before, especially regarding a conflict sensitive approach and to adjust the program and operations after an ever changing context in close dialogue uh, between the donor partner and the recipient partner. And then fifth, uh, but not the least, uh, coordination and communication with other donor countries to encourage cooperation between uh, partners, but also to find synergies within our own administration in Sweden at the global, at the regional and at the national levels. So mo most agree in theory that these principles are good and relevant, and some of them have been repeated in similar forums like this throughout the years. So why isn't this the reality then? Um, fortunately, we in CEDA don't have many constraints on the above principles. On the contrary, these are encouraged within our organization and from the ministry. The only constraint we have in my unit is that, uh, in that sense, is that we have a limited financial volume to manage compared to our sister units for other global strategies. But we are well aware that other donor countries uh, colleagues in other countries have far more restraints to these principles uh, in practice, and that's where the core of the problem is. I would therefore like to ask all donor representatives, there were 14% here uh, today, uh, but also others uh, listening in, uh, considering, consider your own constraints in pursuing these and, and try to address them internally, or at least bring them out into the open and let's talk about them so we, that we can join jointly try to solve them, preferably together also with our implementing partners. For example, do we really need to continue to ask partners uh, for detailed quarterly reporting following our own donor formats? Why do we continue funding on an annual basis? Isn't there something we can do uh, in order to set up more of multi-year agreements? Do we really need to earmark our funding that hard in all cases? Can we try to provide more flexibility in our own funding and also start trusting our partners more? Can we start sharing internal assessments or abuse more to increase that trust in partners whose success we all have a stake in? Are there other things we could change in our operations in order to follow these principles? And as for partners receiving funding, I'm fully aware that this is not easy to follow these principles if the donor in question are not doing it. But there is always room for at least dialogue and negotiation around these in order to accomplish at least one or a few of them. CEDA Sweden will continue our efforts around the good peace building financing initiative and these principles. Uh, and we stand behind you in whatever way we can. We hope that as many as possible donors and recipients and implementers can and will join us in practicing what most of us have been preaching for so long. Thanks for listening. Wonderful, thank you so much, Peter. And it's powerful to, to hear your call to other donors. And thank you for noting, yes, um, on our poll, the don donors were 14% of our audience today. INGOs were 55% and local peace builders were 6%. Um, so interesting, uh, particularly from the INGO perspective to think about our different roles in the system and how we can try to uh, support each other. Um, I think we have Eddie back. Um, Eddie, I saw that you are here and I'm not sure if your camera is on. Eddie, uh, can we pass it back to you? Okay, thank you, uh, Riva, for uh, giving me uh, the opportunity once again. Uh, I lost my connection, but uh, I don't know uh, what did you get uh, from what I, I, I have uh, already said, uh, in order to have uh, an idea uh, of uh, where uh, I have to to uh, to go uh, for the next. Uh, I don't know what did you get for or from the uh, what I I I I've already 
said we definitely heard you say that donors seem to be ghosts um we heard your reflection that they are rarely seen uh, where you are and you were just speaking about your perception that there are too many intermediaries um in the system and so it's hard it makes it less uh less visible to see the good work that local peace builders are doing on the ground Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I think that uh, it's uh, uh, my reflection uh, regarding the, the first question, uh, but uh, uh, about the second question, uh, what need to change in order for, uh, for, for me, for us to uh, play the ideal role highlighted in the first question? I think in my Humble, uh, humble opinion, what needs to change in the way the global peace building uh, financing system uh, is currently designed, uh, where local uh, civil society does not have a conducive uh, space to interact with donors, uh, with UN, uh, uh, for instance, uh, fact that uh, Given that the administration of the, for uh, for instance, uh, the administration of the intimate uh, intermediary uh, organization is most uh, often uh, 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 it's uh, using uh, the 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 the, uh, the large uh, the large some of uh, the budget uh, or the, the, the administration uh, of the intermediaries uh, organizations uh, is using uh, more a budget than the uh, some program uh, and that uh, doesn't allow a fund to be uh, to reach out of the uh, beneficiaries on the grassroots level uh, the beneficiaries uh, see only uh, the crime and uh, uh, they, they are still uh, living in their uh, misery. Uh, and the, uh, some of the uh, peace building projects uh, don't have a good impact uh, on the ground. Uh, and the, the, the impact is not too perceptible on the ground and the beneficiaries remain in their initial situation because uh, uh, the administration uh, a lot of uh, fines and uh, use uh, less than uh, the, 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 the budget that is used uh, by the administration. And that did, uh, doesn't allow a uh, project to get a good uh, impact on the ground. So this uh, system should be a uh, change and uh, we, we will need to, uh, to shift the power uh, from the uh, top to down, from the, the global to local in order to, uh, uh, to be more efficiency and more effective uh, in be, uh, peace building uh, activities, peace building projects. Uh, in terms of what, uh, I can say regarding the the, the last question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, how can the other speakers, the other organizations or institutions uh, support uh, us in uh, pushing uh, the changes uh, that I've uh, I've uh, I've mentioned uh, in the the, sec the second uh, question? I think. Uh, that could be possible uh, by supporting our strategic plan. Uh, I, I'm talking about the, the strategic plan of uh, our organization, uh, Bureau de Soutien or uh, support or DRC support office. Uh, how a strategic plan which aims to uh, at supporting community-based organizations and civil society organizations at the local level in capacity building in order to make them more ef effective uh, and more resilient uh, as well as more cohesive. 
uh, and also they must be a more credible and more autonomous. Uh, to support them in advocacy actions at the local, provincial, national, and international level so that they have more resources uh, to eradicate poverty, which is one of the major causes of the conflict uh, in the local uh, in the local communities, uh, and to carry out uh, their local initiatives, which are the most often very uh, realistic and uh, offering local solution to local problems, uh, for instance. And also, lastly, we should also like to help them to coordinate well uh, their actions in order to avoid duplication, competition, and re uh, rival between them and for lasting peace uh, uh, at the community level. Uh, I think from uh, my local perspective, uh, it, that I can uh, give as uh, a small uh, contribution. Thank you for reminding uh, me uh, about the time. I think I'm done with what uh, I, I, I suppose to, to, to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, we really appreciate your insights and the theme of better coordination is certainly emerging here. Um, and so now our final speaker, uh, we will pass the floor to Megan Price, who is the head of the Knowledge Platform on Security and Rule of Law. Megan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reva. And thanks for uh, the audience for joining. Also, I want to particularly appreciate Eddie for persevering through those connectivity issues. I can understand how frustrating that might be. Um, I first want to kind of just applaud the, the initiative here because I think that we have for a long time really focused a lot on what are the stumbling blocks, what are the frustrations, and I, I am happy to hear a conversation where we're looking for solutions and looking for ways forward. Um, so to answer the first question about who we are as the knowledge platform and specifically what we're trying to do, um, to play our ideal role. We, among un uh, many things, manage a small grants facility, the Knowledge Management Fund. This is a catalytic and small scale fund that allows grantees to have some room for maneuver, to, to experiment, to innovate. Um, and we try to convey very concretely to our grantees that they are not obliged to succeed necessarily. They are not obliged to prove their theory. They are not obliged to um, ensure that their deliverables are exactly what they promised. What they are obliged to do is to learn. And secondly, they're obliged to, to pass that learning on to others and to help that learning uh, challenge the system as it stands. Um, and I think that that's something that we aspire to. That's something that we were almost stumbling into because originally our grant was primarily focused around research. We've expanded it to also support small pilot initiatives. But I wanna come back to that core idea of that primarily our, our, our fund was initially around research. And maybe that's a really critical idea that we can collectively here help us move towards a solution. A lot of the problems that I've been hearing today, both at the global level, but also at the local level, are around the ways in which local peace building organizations are kind of held to account, how they're held accountable, who gets to define what success is. And I think a lot of it is built in and even baked in to the way that we see local peace building as an implementation, as an execution of a goal. And how radical could it be to start demonstrating our confidence or even our trust in local peace builders by treating them not necessarily as implementers of global ideas, but as innovators, as researchers, as experimenters. Because exactly as I think Chalet put it, that could be the comparative advantage that is being invested in. Um, and I think as, as Eddie put it before, he was, was so rudely cut off by internet. They are designing, they are, they are thinking on their feet. They are working with local communities in incredibly dynamic environments. Um, so can we respect them as designers? Can we respect them as innovators and as researchers in their own right? And if we were to do that, what would it look like if we could fund peace building 
more as the research and development unit of our sector. And when I, when I say that here, I mean very much the local peace building that's happening when there is direct, um, let's say the direction of the programs are run by people who are directly impacted by the programs. They're working on solutions that are, are happening in their own communities. Um, and what would that look like? And then I also wanted to point out how behind the ball we might be on this in the development sector. The development sector for a long time has been very project oriented. Uh, you can read it right through the OECD guidelines on a project evaluation. It's about sustainability, about impact, effect, uh, efficacy and efficiency. It's about a lot of times budget expenditure. All of these things, in my view, are catering to the needs of the donor to be accountable for their public funds. But it's not out of the realm of possibility to understand that public funds can be spent on experimentation, on innovation, on radical innovation even. And as just a very small slash very large example, um, think about the way in which the US military invests in research and development. The US military's uh, budget for research and development last year, their DARPA program was three and a half billion, three and a half billion just for research and, and, and development. There is in, in understanding that as, a, as a, a unit or a way in which we invest in experimentation, those projects are not being held to account in terms of did they yield an, a concrete output? They're being held to account of did they follow a good process of design? Are, is the strategy aligned with the core strategy of, of, of the government in this case? Um, are the designers keeping in mind what the end product and the end users would ultimately benefit from? And are they constantly pushing towards that? Um, so I just wanted to put a couple ideas out there in terms of what we could maybe do to try and encourage understanding of local peace building as not entirely, but at least partially around this innovation and this experimentation and how that could actually radically change the dynamic between the donor and, um, and, and the local peace builder, um, perhaps. That's something that I, uh, I am hoping for our Knowledge Management Fund to continue to do and to improve in how we do that. Um, and it's something that I would like to invite others to, to experiment with us. The other thing that I want to say is that it doesn't necessarily require huge amounts of money. You don't need that three and a half billion that the US dedicates to their experiments in, in the military. Um, and in fact, that three and a half billion, just to put it in perspective, is 0.4% of the overall budget of, uh, of the US military. But if you were to take that uh, and compare it to, for example, this new EU peace facility, which is 5 billion in total, well, half a percent of that is probably something around 20 million. So 20 million for innovative, flexible funding that would allow local peace builders to be able to design and, and try and experiment and be held accountable primarily for what they've learned and how they've shared that learning, I think could really help um, radically change some of these and get us over some of these accountability um, constraints that are primarily driven by this idea of implementer um, donor relationship. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it there because I really am curious and eager to hear um, our respondents as well. So I wanna save some time, but thank you very much all. Wonderful, thank you so, so much, Megan, for that call for radical innovation and um, how we think about research and development and support local peace builders work. Uh, so now we will turn um, to our three colleagues to give their reflections following the thoughts of our speakers. Uh, on good peace building financing. So first I'm going to invite Eliska Jelenkova, who is the co-director of programs at the United Network of Young Peace Builders. Eliska. Thank you so much, Riva. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Eliska Jelenkova and I'll be sharing from the perspective of a co-director of an international youth-led network with an international secretariat in the Netherlands. I'll be also sharing realities from our 128 members who work locally in over 70 countries, most of them post-conflict. Uh, when I talk about uh, youth-led, I mean youth uh, between the ages of 18 and 35, not uh, children. Um, so the vast majority of peace building funding goes to governments or big INGOs, not local NGOs, and especially not youth-led groups, uh, which is no surprise. 
current peace building financing mechanisms have administrative barriers that the majority of youth organizations, especially informal youth groups, cannot meet. The vast majority of youth led organizations are completely volunteer run and with a budget of less than $10,000 a year. Some funds offer grants that are too big to manage by smaller organizations. Other grants are too limited and project bound and don't allow for project staff to be compensated for their work, making the future of an organization even less uncertain and the development of capacity even less likely. Even youth focused peace building funding instruments rarely make much space for youth organizations to be in the lead. You know why is glad to have CETA as one of its main donors that supports youth leadership and creative approaches to peace building. Sustainability of funding is crucial to sustainable peace building. Very core funding uh, grants available, meaning uh, youth organizations cannot develop their capacity and internal processes, even if they wanted to. Since a lot of donors prefer to work via intermediaries, the effect is that small youth organizations cannot develop a good funding track record and are forced to become NGOs or remain ineligible for most funding opportunities. On top of this, when funding is available, it often pressures youth-led organizations to focus on countering or prevention of violent extremism, as this, often, as this can often be the only way to access resources. And since Megan stated some figures, I will also give you some. Uh, in 2019, um, the UN system had uh, over $500 million of secured funding for counter-terror and uh, prevention of violent extremism programming. Meanwhile, 49% of youth-led organizations worldwide are operating under $5,000 per annum. So that's half of the organizations. Um, I leave it up to you to decide for yourselves whether the counter-terrorism funding was money well spent. Overall, most organizations within our network have reported smaller budgets in 2020 compared to 2019. This is coming from our annual impact review. Uh, and as I see, I have very little time left. Uh, I'm gonna uh, offer some solution very quickly. So to address this huge funding gap, a youth sensitive methodology has been designed by UNOY, Search for Common Ground and UNNOC to resource youth peace building by overcoming the YPS funding challenges and using comprehensive capacity strengthening approach. We're calling it U360, and it's an approach to resource the formal and informal youth groups, the peace building front lines that was piloted in 2020 in Asia, to, thanks to funding from CEDA and UNFPA. It focuses on small organizations and non elite youth groups and supports them without enforcing NGOization, but strengthening peer to peer and youth adult partnerships. It has components like collaborative conflict analysis, capacity building through mentoring, participatory grant making uh, for smart grants, and crowdfunding. Those of you who are joining the following session, Unlocking the Potential of Youth-Led Peace Building, a little plug there, we'll hear more about it from young peace builders who went through the pilot program themselves. To very shortly summarize, we're not asking that young people are given funding with no questions asked and no evaluation mechanisms in place. We're proposing that we move past the one-way donor-recipient relationship uh, towards an equal partnership where youth expertise and lived experience is valued, trusted, and adequately resourced. And that is exactly what U360 methodology and the YPS Global Fund that UNOI and Search for Common Ground launched this March of this year aim to do. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alishka. And, and now we will turn to Teresa Dumasi, who is the Director of Research, Advisory and Policy at Conciliation Resources. Teresa, the floor is yours. Um, I was just going to, we've been recently thinking and working with HD um, Swiss Peace and um, uh, the European Institute for Peace on the funding of early stage peace talks. Now, this is a particular, uh, particularly risky, I suppose, in terms of the, the risk of non-achievement, the risk of security risks, uh, all sorts of kind of compliance risk and legal risk associated with that, the funding of those kind of activities. And so um, I think, um, and it's also about the uh, funding of relationship building as well. Less about sometimes the activities, but those needs to be sustained. Um, and so I, we observe some of the same um, problems around funding as has been mentioned, but I think there's an, an, an additional one in this space is that it's quite a busy space. So you have quite a lot of donor, increasing donor interest in mediation, and you also have donor doers. So people, uh, organizations who are both funding and implementing at the same time. So there's kind of a need for 
collaboration, coordination, working out who's in the system, and it's incumbent on all of us to for the efficiencies in those areas. But the one thing I was going to mention was, um, in some ways, um, we we're very aware of the kind of people are very um, aid weary public, I suppose, in a number of the Western countries. And I think there's a need for greater making the political case for peace building more cleverly. Um, and this could relate to, um, for example, relating what peace building means for the broader development and sustainable development agenda, um, having clear objectives, not over promising. So um, and making those realistic um, and being more savvy about communications. There's been quite a lot of interesting work in uh, the States uh, through AF AFP on, on this area, but um, using um, just um, relating it, I suppose, peace building to a political interest, I suppose, in some of these countries and donor countries. I think also, I think we should be drawing on, there's lots of innovation in terms of particularly, I'd highlight two areas around how we measure impact. Um, more innovative participatory um, processes like outcome harvesting and so on, which I think um, are less where you don't set the kind of rhetorical outcome at the beginning, but you have this iterative process and, and more donors are trying that with their implementing partners. And it also, it would still meet the need for accountability donors have to their publics mm -hmm. because you get the results, but you're less linear and you're less predictive in the way you're, you're saying what you're going to achieve. And you may also capture the unintended consequences, uh, sorry, the unintended benefits and uh, positive results. And then the other thing I think I was going to mention was around um, the operating costs. There's innovations in how people are calculating the real costs of um, doing peace building. Uh, we recently commissioned some LSE students to look at how you could actually um, measure the invisible time that peace builders spend. And they came up with three potential models that we could try out um, in that area. But the other thing I'd mentioned that hasn't been mentioned is, yep, the um, how um, the compliance um, area where with high risk work, particularly where you're trying to start a peace process, which is and these are often local peace builders doing this, but they're subject to all sorts of legal constraints. And I think we need to look at how we address those prepare safeguards, particularly from counterterrorism regulations and legal constraints. Um, for this to allow this space and those um, opportunities and entry points to um, uh, flourish. Wonderful, thank you so much, Teresa. And now we will uh, move to our um, our final reflector. Um, Marina Kumskova is a senior UN policy and advocacy advisor at the Global Partnership for the, for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. Marina. Thank you so much, Shiva, and all the speakers and respondents for this learning. It has been quite an incredible conversation. Listening to your points, I just wanted to add two points from GPAC experience. Um, GPAC, we are the global network of local peace builders. And something that we have seen recently in the policy space is that really the recognition of the role of local peace builders has been improving. Uh, two evidence of it is the adoption of the community engagement guidelines that really supports that partnership building between the UN and local peace builders. And the second point is really mention of local peace builders in the recent resolution on peace building and sustaining peace. And as Marco said, the donor community can adapt and can become a stronger actor and perhaps exploring together how the change in policy can be also reflected in practice. Don donors first can encourage authentic partnership between donor community and intermediate uh, between um, the local community and intermediaries. In our project uh, that Peace Building Fund funded in Kyrgyzstan, what GPAC did is we shared the role with our local partner in a way that gave them leadership and flexibility in determining the direction of the pro uh, project and the way they could adjust the project. And it doesn't mean that the role of intermediaries is always irrelevant. Sometimes local organizations are very small and they need organi intermediary organizations to handle some of the administrative burdens and support uh, 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 awareness raising at the global stage, right, which a lot of donors require at the end of the day. Uh, and at, at the same time, we have to recognize that this is not because local peace builders cannot do that. 
it's just maybe this is not their space and this is maybe the role that intermediary can better fulfill and uh, fit into. That's why um, I guess the suggestion could be is that donors need to support this type of intermediary approach that encourages authentic partnership by providing guidelines for intermediaries to operationalize values of this type of partnership and encourage accountability for on the ground impact. Highlighting Eddie's point, it's also important to manage this relationship in a way that equalizes not only power relationship, but also financial relationships, right? In a way that distributes funds more or less equally. And my last point is that when it comes to the selection of grant recipients, and uh, it would be important to engage people who do, not, who do the work themselves in the decision making on the grants. I'm not talking about perhaps making civil society as a part of the decision making process, but perhaps consulting on um, the, not the consulting on the selection criteria could be one option. At GPAC, what we did is we engage our young local peace builders, uh, the working group, the YPS working group that we have in GPAC to make decision on who gets the grant on YPS uh, to support YPS work as a part of our small grants project and what we what has resulted out of it is quite impressive all of this project brought results and uh, we were able to build um, yps networks in nigeria in libya really to set the foundation of sustaining peace or based on which the organizations like unoy and local youth organizations can then further build on so um i guess just to reiterate it would be great if donors would give a little bit further considerations on how they could include civil society expertise in their um, selection process and uh, what that could look like. Thank you so much. Um, great conversation. Looking forward for the points from uh, all of the speakers as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marina. Um, and I am actually, I'm going to go back and do a lightning round um, with each of our speakers. So I'm, I'm going to hand it back to, in the order uh, that they spoke previously. So I'm going to hand it back to Shale and then Marcus, Eddie, Peter, and Megan, just for one reflection um, from each of you on uh, something that struck you from this conversation or, or a concrete way that we can move forward um, in terms of effectively funding uh, local peace builders and financing the peace building system. So, Shale. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Riva. I think one, one aspect that I would like to reflect more is, and uh, I think most of the speakers have uh, alluded to, is the necessity of uh, financing uh, peace building to be long term. Uh, I think uh, peace building is about building relationship and, and building relationship takes time. Uh, and therefore project based, based uh, uh, project based will not be able to solve some of the long term relationship building that uh, peace builders are aspiring to. And I think some of our donors are, 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 are already aware about that in terms of uh, those kind of longevity in terms of financing peace building. And, and I like to thank CEDA for being one of the uh, donors that are already thinking about, and they have been working with the Life and Peace Institute for a very long time in, 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 in implementing peace building activities, which have a very long term approach. And I think other donors also need to uh, put a lot of emphasis on the need for having long term. And, and finally, I want to uh, think about uh, the coordination aspect. Uh, a lot of uh, peace building activities are, are very are happening in different sectors and in different fields and difficult ge geographical space and are doing a lot of good work. But the problem is this lack of proper coordination between all those sectors and all those uh, activities so that it have a meaningful impact in the long run. And, 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 and this is happening because of the fear of competition. If we remove the fear of competition from uh, the peace building sector and, 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 and we stick to experience, we stick to need on the ground and, and, and therefore some of this fear will, will we have to grow some of this fear and be able to uh, make peace building a long-term effective uh, adventure thank you very much for giving me this opportunity Deva, thank you thank you shale marcus uh, thanks Riva. um no i yeah, in, 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 in a very brief way, there's so much that was raised, so uh, hard to choose what struck me most. I mean, I, I, I really 
I think I would like to spend a good amount of time to pick one thing on Megan's reflections um, on how to think and conceive of, um, especially local peace builders, but I think that goes a bit wider, you know, not just as implementers of, of a particular global paradigm, but, but as, as, as innovators uh, and experimenters and what that means for design. Uh, and, and how we assess it. I think that's a really, uh, uh, there's a lot to that, uh, especially given how much this field struggles with applying, um, you know, sort of standard development M&E approaches to, to the peace building field and demonstrating impact and so forth and to, to really take a change the perspective on that. So that, that was, I think, one thing I, I, it struck me a lot. And I guess one last thing, given, you know, we, we talk a lot about particular youth um, peace building. So I, I think I'd, I'd like to make a plug again in, in something that has changed quite a bit in the peace building fund. It, it has become, you know, as far as UN funding instruments, which of course are always funded by member states uh, for the most part, the, 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 the largest dedicated funding instrument for youth peace and security uh, issues in, in, in the UN and which has gone from I just have to remind myself of what that was, but we were a few years ago when we started these initiatives, we were in 2016, that was the first one was 2.7 million. And last year it was $22 million of, of the annual uh, allocations that the fund made. So, and the growth of this was because, you know, we got more and more and better and better uh, proposals in this, right? So again, as, as a community to see that um, uh, of what was coming forth, and and but also in the exchange, and that I, I want to also encourage, of course, that we continue with a lot of the actors that are here and 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 beyond to keep on feeding back on what we should also particularly um, focus on uh, in order to, on one hand, because you know we have a competitive thing, and Charlotte just said, you know, we also have to be careful that competition isn't always the best thing. Um, and yet, uh, it, it, it is one way in order to, to, to make it possible for more to apply that don't have to go through a particularly formal government-led uh, process that may you know, also shut other people out. Um, so it opens up the floor, but we can still also uh, dedicate and steer things towards certain topics. So this week we're launching this year's round of the youth promotion initiative. And because of feedback, et cetera, we said we will prioritize proposals that promote protecting civic spaces for youth, that promote strengthening mental health and psychosocial well-being for youth as part of local peace building processes. And of course, under the overall rubric of promoting meaningful participation of youth in local peace building. And that's based on feedback of what people said, this is where currently are the biggest gaps and the biggest needs. So please set markers as a donor that you're really prioritizing these things. And I think that's uh, important and we can do these things. Thanks. Great. Uh, Eddie. Just one quick minute, one reflection. Yeah. Thank you, Arriva. And I would like to thank all the speakers and all the audience uh, for being part uh, of this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to uh, mention what I've mentioned uh, in my uh, speech that uh, local peace builders. Uh, Local civil society uh, organizations and uh, community-based organizations seem to be out of the the system uh, that we, we we have been talking about. And uh, what I can say is that we need uh, them to be part of the system uh, financing uh, system uh, in order to. Uh, give them uh, opportunity to discuss and to raise uh, local perspective for peace building. And lastly, uh, I think that it should be good to uh, create uh, a conducive space uh, for all of us in order to discuss and to share experience and uh, also to work together from. Uh, uh, from the local, from local to global. Uh, I think that is my uh, last uh, contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eddie. And thank you, as Megan said, for thank persevering. Um, uh, great, Peter. Thanks, that'll be very short. Thanks to all, um, uh, very good uh, comments. Uh, if I were to pick one, 
uh, it was uh, Megan's comment on uh, or, or pitch for being innovative and experimental and, and, and so forth and the, uh, the need for taking risks also. Um, I, I would say that those five principles that I was talking about very much support uh, you know, being uh, innovative and support others who can be innovative in the way, uh, for example, to set up a, a, f a flexible funding uh, of, a, of a program. Uh, that's something we have done with, together with the uh, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue uh, and that could complement uh, core funding in, in the way that, uh, you know, uh, allowing for more innovation or, or moving uh, funds between posts and so forth uh, and seeing opportunities as they arise, but particularly political momentum in, the, in their case of, of you know, um, of being peace negotiators. Um, yeah, I would, I would stop there. Thanks all. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. And Megan. Great. Thanks very much. Um, no, I just primarily want to thank everyone for, for coming to this, uh, to this, to this meeting with such honesty and, and candor about the needs and the, and the, and the struggles sometimes, but, um, maybe in my last comment, I maybe wanted to reflect a bit on what I think Shale pointed out. It was a really, really important barrier that we need to continue to keep our focus on was the way in which funding might create competition between could-be allies. And I think that another way that we can look at how uh, an, a research and development approach or an innovation approach might help this is one way that research and development is often funded, or even if you think about investments, uh, it's about uh, portfolios and portfolio management so that the the pressure for success doesn't fall on any individual one initiative but rather it's the accumulation of the collective um, so you can throw you know resources and attention into a, a wide variety of projects with the ambition that some will fail but some will also succeed and it's the portfolio um, that that really matters and that also can help create um, collaboration between those individual projects. It's one thing that we're hoping to, to build on in our next iteration of the Knowledge Management Fund, where our grantees are directly connected with one another so that they can use each other as, as resources in a way. A lot of them are struggling with similar problems. Uh, we want to make sure that we almost create kind of a graduating class of our grantees so that they see each other as allies and as resource people. Um, so I would, I would also advocate to see where in, uh, in what structures donors could also look to help build bridges between their individual grantee projects. Um, but again, thanks everyone for such a rich conversation. It's been really enjoyable to be a part of. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to all of our speakers and respondents. Agree, really rich conversation and hard to focus on a on a one or two points even. So many uh, good issues and really concrete examples were raised. Um, just in closing, we're out of time. We're two minutes over, um, which I'm really proud of all of our speakers for <laughs> sticking very well to their timeframes. Um, just, just to note that there are many conversations happening around peace building financing. I think there were seven uh, here at CIPRI this year. And some of the issues, I think we were hoping to, to leave each of you with these questions around, you know, how we can each take action, whether we are sitting in an INGO or in a catalytic funding mechanism, uh, sitting in, a don in the donor seat or working as a local peace builder, how can we each take action and work together to uh, create a more effective system and, you know, better shift power to local actors. I think efficiency and more collaboration came up, the idea of supporting, amplifying radical innovation. Um, and, I, and I think there were many things that were highlighted that we already are doing. So, uh, you know, Alishka mentioned uh, that they've developed a youth sensitive methodology. Um, Teresa mentioned that there are new approaches to impact. Um, and of course, Megan talked about their approach to, you know, research and development development and innovation. So I think all to say, there are so many great ideas, um, you know, to solve these challenges out there, they continue to be kind of disparate. And I think as we leave this conversation, we can each reflect who is best positioned, both to show leadership from the donor side on really pushing these principles forward. Um, and then also to, to support and finance, how is all of this work around more efficiency and collaboration? around amplifying innovation, all of this needs to be resourced. And so how and who does that? 
Um, and so I will, I will leave it there. Thank you so much for joining again, this really rich conversation. And I know the Dag Hammerhold Foundation and LPI and all of us uh, on the panel today really welcome further conversation and input. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Riva, for your moderation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks all so on. much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.